Apple Knocker Radio. All right. So um, can you start by uh, telling us a little bit about your background pr- uh, previous to the egg? Yes. There's, um, it's a pretty long story, and that's why I wrote about um, – basically, I wrote a book because I wanted to stop telling the same story over and over and get into the fun stuff. Right, and I, I just um, want to say I do appreciate yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's but for the, totally cool. to get people to read the book. Nice little intro. <laughs> there you go, right? Um, yeah, my life uh, – the truth is stranger than fiction. So there you go. There's a little tip for you. But I was born in the Detroit area. So, of course, you know, I was raised to be an engineer, automotive, you know, factory worker, s- sort of like that. And so I was born in 70 in the Detroit area. And my dad was a factory worker. My brother still works for, you know, Ford Motor Company. My mom would, worked for, um, she had several jobs, but she worked for a Ford dealership, you know. So it seemed like it was just a family thing. I worked for a Ford supplier, automotive supplier. But, you know, I look back at all what I'll, what I'll tell you, it was, it was such a puzzle piece. Everything fit together. <clears throat> so the engineering background I, I needed to live the life I'm living now. Then I decided, um, you know, I needed to get out of Michigan to really find my path. And so I ended up in Texas running or helping to run an international telecom consulting firm. So I needed the international business to be where I am today. And then, you know, I end up getting into Hollywood and being a Hollywood producer for um, a film which I dated Elvis's stepbrother, David Stanley. So people that know Elvis, they knew he had a stepbrother, you know, yada, yada. And we did a film about his life with Elvis. And so I needed that to have the stage presence, the extemporaneous communication. And, you know, I learned a lot from David who learned from Elvis who had, you know, he captured an audience. I mean, he was just what he's been dead for over 30 years and people are still making movies about him. Like who was he? Right. Right. So I needed all that background. So my background is engineering, international business, um, and telecommunications and then Hollywood. And then of course the crash, which for me was doing all that as an over, you know, being an overachiever type a personality always wanted to prove myself. Um, then I came into a really stressful medical situation where, I really needed to take a step back and look at, is this the career I'm supposed to be having? Or, you know, what does God, the universe have in store for me? So that's kind of where it started. Mm. And then, and then the egg, can you explain how your idea for the egg um, came to you? So I was, I've always been intuitive. Um, I was born under the astrology sign of Scorpio, always been intuitive, but when you're a little kid and you just get information, you think everybody gets this. You think, oh, this is normal that I ask for uh, an answer and it's given to me. I open up a book, there's the answer. I hear the the messages coming in from the right side and I'm not really that smart. So I know I'm getting information from somewhere. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's where the information comes in. And I love it because it's really guided me. It's been a guiding, you know, light and a guiding um, factor in my life, my whole life. But I didn't know until I was older that not everybody had this gift. So when I was saying, okay, I need to find a modality that's going to help me. And I knew Western medicine had failed me in the past. And I found sound and light therapy. It was all very divinely guided, but I still was stubborn. I'm still a Scorpio. And so I was stubbornly resisting either, you know, starting a new career with that modality. And so when I found the modality, it was one thing after another, all these serendipitous um, things happened to me. And one thing led to another. And I thought, you know, the biggest sin of all is not utilizing your God-given gift. And I thought my God-given gift was project management, producing, corporate, operations officer, you know, you know, that kind of stuff. But every door I tried to walk through to get another job was slammed right in my face. And so I finally, um, it was like a bad country song. I lost my house. I lost my dog. I lost my job. I lost everything. I thought, just let me just play that song backwards and get, all my, get my dog back, get my house back, get my job back, right? <laughs> And so I thought, okay, well, um, you know, standing there with stripped from my identity with nothing, 
I, I just looked at, you know, looked up in the sky. I'm like, if you want me to do something, you should really hit me in the head with it because I'm not getting it. And it was sound and light therapy. And then I found the, a light box that was a chamber in Arizona and, and it really helped me a lot. So then I said, okay, I'm going to say yes to this. And as soon as I said yes to this new career, everything started flowing. So, you know, in my emails, it says, let it flow. Mm -hmm. And that has a whole story behind it. We'll save for later um, or another interview. So it was really interesting how when I said yes to what my destiny was, everything started flowing. So if Mm -hmm. your audience, if anybody's stuck out there, they're probably not on the right path. Even if they, it seems like they are, if they're struggling, if they're hitting brick walls, if things aren't flowing, I always say now, let it, if it doesn't flow, let it go. So finally had to just let everything else go and just standing there, just, you know, naked, if you will, and saying, okay, show me what I need to do. And as soon as I said, yes, it was, it was just flowing. So I really love that I was paying attention, um, even though I wish I would have paid attention a little sooner. But everything that's happened to me up until now made me who I am. Mm. And so I said yes to the sound and light therapy. And then the light box was there. And I started to see that there was something more that could come of this. I saw the light box being very helpful physically and environmentally. But I didn't see it really hitting the emotional and the spiritual that I really wanted to see. So, you know, I said, let's dig a little deeper. What if, what if it was 360 degrees instead of a rectangular box? Um, Then you would hear clients say, well, you know, I don't like laying on my back and the sound sounds distorted coming up through the foam pad. And as I hired light engineers and sound engineers, what I found was, you know, there's certain cubic airspace that needs to have certain speakers. Hmm. And, you know, there's, so there's all these different aspects of what I was learning and I'm a researcher and I try to stay very humble. So I, I know that I don't know everything. And I love to, you know, ask people what they think and um, get other people's advice and then take all those pieces of the puzzle and put them together. So it's really been fun. And when you look at my astrology chart, private investigator, um, shaman and healer is kind of the flavor of it. Hmm. And so I thought it was interesting because I feel like I'm always looking for a solution and sometimes to a fault. And my aunt called me um, and she was telling me something and I want to jump right into the solution. Here's the solution. She's like, wait, can you just listen to the whole story before you say anything? I said, oh yeah, of course. Uh, But you know, I'm, I'm already like, okay, what's the solution? How can I help? I don't want anybody to be, you know, in pain and suffering if there's a solution And I'll jump right in, try to find that solution to fall. Blessing Mm. and a curse. That's interesting because it seems like your um, the engineering part of your mind, that kind of problem solving and systematic way of uh, thinking, is actually a complement to your also your intuitive interests. Whereas you would think, or I would think anyway, that they would be like contradictory and you'd, they'd be fighting each other. But it sounds like in you, you've kind of found like a synthesis between the two. I have. I found the balance and it's so lovely because I, I like to be a critical thinker. So, you know, you come up with something and say, okay, what if this or what if that? And how did this become something? So there's a story I like to tell there was a generation, uh, generations of families that would cut off the top of the turkey for Thanksgiving dinner, and they would just always cut off the top of the turkey. And so finally, one daughter said to her mom, why do we cut off the top of the turkey? And she says, I don't know, because my mom did it. So hmm. she asked her mom and her mom, you know, said, I did it because my mom did it. Her mom happened to be still alive. Um, probably in her 90s. And she said, because the oven was really small and I had to cut it off to make it fit. (laughs) So I'm the one that says, why do do we do this? Why are we doing this? That's me. Hmm, That's interesting. And so I I actually should specify for the the listeners who aren't familiar uh, yet. So the end product, the egg, could you explain... um, Let's just start with, can you explain generally the egg? Like it was this modification of this the light box. But um, now, can you explain the product a, a little bit? 
So it's a beautifully designed wooden egg. When most people told me it would, I couldn't make it. You can't make a large wooden egg. So it's 11 foot by 11 foot by seven foot. I don't actually remember the metrics of it, the millimeters, but it had to be made out of wood because wood is such a living energy, a conscious, you know, um, product. And every egg has its own personality. It's so cute because every egg is made out of a different tree because there's not one egg that's the same because every tree has a different energy, a different spirit, where it was grown, um, you know, what it was surrounded by, how it was harvested. It's just so beautiful. And so you're in this egg that I've also used sacred geometry. So the consciousnesses that came into my field when I was building this was Edgar Cayce, Royal Rife, Wilhelm Reich, and Nikola Tesla. So those are the energies that I feel like is involved, plus my past lives in Egypt and some of the stuff that I brought in through that. So with Edgar Cayce, he talks about in in an essay that he wrote called Auras, if someone can bring together the spiritual forces of sound, and I'm paraphrasing, and the spiritual forces of light, it'd be a great modality for the future. Then Tesla says things like, uh, if you can find, you know, the secrets to three, six, and nine, you'll know all the answers and mysteries of the universe. And he also talks about, you know, frequency, vibration, and energy. So what I did is I have the outside of the egg is paneled 12 sides, so a dodecagon. And then you have the two parabolas of the egg inside. And you're sitting straight on with the two speakers on the side. And you're reclined in a zero gravity chair. So the outside being 12 sides is really a three. Two plus one is a three. There's a hexagon platform that the chair sits on and the hexagon is six sided. And then you have 360 degrees of the egg and the shape of the egg, according to Victor Schauberger is the most powerful shape in the universe. So if you take all this stuff together and then look at the Oregon box from Wilhelm Reich, And then you look at the right frequencies and how he used frequencies under his universal microscope to help people to um, heal from different maladies. I tried to bring all that together with the sacred geometry, which is a very powerful, um, uh, I guess, energy within itself. In a lot of times, in ancient times, you will find sacred geometric buildings and um, statues or physical structures that are still standing. And we've actually had um, egg centers go through hurricanes, tornadoes, and fires all survived. It just seemed to go around the egg centers, which is still blows my engineering mind on a whole lot of levels, right? So I feel like when you're inside the egg, it's it transmutes or transcends sound or time and space. And so a lot of people will go in and say, it felt like 15 minutes, but it's really five zero minutes. So there's Mm. 40 minutes of music and each piece of music is designed by high vibrational musicians and really for the, the whole intention of love. So love heals all, you know, the Beatles, Love is all there is, you know, all that good stuff. All you need is love. So when you have something that's infused with love and intention, the way that I think I've created it, and it wasn't my brains, it was just the downloads that came through from my higher self, if you will. Then you go into this this space where your body and your soul can kind of get closer to your higher self. And it lifts a veil where you can see truth, where truth is being hidden. And so it's been really interesting because it increases your spirit, your like your intuitive uh, skill set and your spirituality. So I can't even watch the media anymore because I get that sick feeling in my stomach. So it feels like it's lie after lie after lie after lie and programming and deception. And it feels really yucky to my body. But I feel like it's because I've lifted that programming of all these 52 years of being programmed. I lifted that and I can see in a different way now. And I feel like most of the clients that have done several egg sessions 
are of the same mindset where the veil is lifting. They're tuning uh, more into their higher self. They're more intuitive and they can see um, through all the programming now. It's really pretty cool. So it's 40 minutes of music, 10 minutes of silence and a sacred geometric egg shaped chamber. And then it's almost like a sonic massage because there's also um, vibration that comes through the chair, like a sonic massage. So there's a whole lot of modalities going on in one. And uh, it's, it's quite extraordinary. And I'm not saying that from a place of ego because it's really not mine. When I actually see my name as the inventor, I laugh because who is Gail Lynn? And what is an inventor? You know, when sound and light therapy has been around for thousands and thousands of years, this isn't new. Hmm. Yeah, something you said there, I, I want to come back to that. It's a big, big picture question. But first, a more practical question. So you said each egg is made out of one tree? Each egg is made out of different trees. So there's not every egg isn't made out of the same tree. But you mean like a, each egg is made out of one tree species, but not literally one tree. Correct. Okay, okay. Uh, that was I was thinking as well. That's interesting. Get one egg out of a tree. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the manufacturing of these eggs, um, especially the first one, um, how did that how did that come about? Did you do it by hand? Can they be done by hand, or is it using machinery? Well, we have to, because of the demand, we have to use uh, CNC machines now to cut the parts, but they're assembled by hand and they're never going to be mass produced because it's just not going to be something that um, this modality or technology is going to be conducive to doing. There has to be that human touch and it's just um, going to have to be built by hand. Mm. So... The, the parts of our machine cut now, but the first egg was interesting because I didn't build it. I just created it in my, you know, in my head and I, I drew it up. I have the CAD and drafting background from the engineering from automotive days. So I drew it up and I had a gentleman who came through and said, uh, you know, I think I can build this for you. Hmm. So it was ugly. It was made <laughs> with, with pressed wood. So the MDF wood. And so, it, you know, it had a smell like a formaldehyde smell from the pressed wood. And I realized that wasn't going to work because mm. you could almost hear all the different spiritual properties of all the different woods that were pressed together, like talking like this. little. <laughs> and I said, no, it'll have to be made out of just a solid wood for it to be the most effective. And it was basically trial and error. And I was already working with doctors. So I had several doctors that were part of the testing of the prototype, healers, channelers, you know, just a, a variety of people that could tell me, what is it doing? How do you feel? Is it too much? If we do two days in a row, can we do three days in a row? Oh, no, that's too much. How long is it too, is too long to be in there? There is a detox reaction that happens. So what was the, the protocol that we had to determine was based on these 12 people that helped me to test it. And roughly how long does it take to manufacture one? Uh, they can probably put one together in about three weeks now. And you make them to order or do you make them and then you make them to order? Yeah, once they're ordered and people start tuning into the energy of their egg and a lot of the eggs are naming themselves. And of course, being from a blue collar environment, Detroit, Midwesterner, this all seemed a little bit cuckoo, um, but it happens every time. People are, I'm already tuned into my egg and my, my egg named itself and told me this was its name. And it's very beautiful. And if you think about them being such somewhat of a self-organizing system, it's interesting because the more eggs that come on the planet, it seems like the more powerful they all become. Hmm. And each egg owner loves their eggs so much. So they're infused with so much love how can you not get some kind of a result out of that? And um, there was a lady in Belgium, but this is what I heard from the Belgium owner. She went into the egg in Belgium and said, aha, the egg in Peru is online. It, it was, it's been delivered. So she calls me up and I said, yeah, in fact, that Peru egg did land on the, on the land in Peru. And she felt that energy hmm. in the egg in Belgium. Wow. And while you're, um, have you, do you meet a lot of, um, 
resistance when you are marketing these and selling these? Um, are, do you find people are receptive or are you finding resistance? Most people are super receptive and a lot yeah. of people expect me to say that the egg is a hundred thousand dollars. And they, they said, you know, that, that would be something that, you know, another business owner might charge, but it's not about greed and money for me. It's about let's, you know, let's get this available to people so that there can be some non-invasive healing without the side effects. So I get a, a lot of people are super supportive. Um, I feel really blessed that there's not been a lot of attacks. I was attacked by the media in 2012, but things have been going so fast. It seems like these energy medicine modalities are really quickly getting into the marketplace and really quickly being adopted um, by society. It's really cool. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing about the time that we're working in right now is because people's trust in the old answers have has been so eroded i think people are more open than ever to um considering new possibilities new paradigms and new products so when somebody's using an egg um is it a do you do you keep going into the egg like through for set periods of time to heal any given condition um how long are the effects expected to last like say somebody goes in with a specific condition uh i don't want to say anything because i don't i think that might be too that might pigeonhole it too much somebody goes in with a specific condition you go in for an egg for a certain amount of treatments and it will heal it or do you have to keep going back to keep the process going and that's a great question because you know there is no one size fits all and that's the problem i'm having with the lack of ethics and energy medicine right now you know people are making a lot of claims and saying a lot of things, you know, you're going to regrow a limb, uh, you know, your cancer is going to be gone in a, you know, in a hot second. Nobody can say anything about, you know, when are the emotions going to leave that maybe created that illness or that dis-ease. So it's all different. What I try to say is let's reset the nervous system and create a new normal. So I say that's at least three sessions. Okay. It's not a magic egg. Although some people go in and have magic, miraculous mm. things happen. But it might be that they're ready. Maybe they've built up uh, doing so many other energy modalities and different, you know, uh, meditations and working on themselves that they get into the egg. And it seems like the egg created the miracle, but it, they were ready for it. Does that make sense? Yes. So I'd say three sessions to help to create a new normal for the autonomic nervous system. And basically, when we have something, we're out of balance, we're out of harmony, and we're in disharmony. So we have to bring the body back into harmony. And a lot of us are just stuck in that fight or flight. We're running from the saber tooth tiger and we're doing that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, that's not a good place for the body to be. You know, that's why we have a parasympathetic nervous system is so we can get out of fight or flight of the sympathetic nervous system and drop into the parasympathetic where the body's healing. So I was stuck in, in the sympathetic nervous system or fight or flight for probably, you know, 40 some years of my life. Hmm. And I realized that there was a parasympathetic nervous system when I was speeding past a cop one day and I felt this warm sensation come up all the way into my neck and I got by, I didn't get the ticket. Uh, he didn't catch me. And then you felt it go back down. I was like, oh my gosh, I just went into fight or flight. And then it went back to the parasympathetic. So you have to retrain the body if you've been stuck in the sympathetic for so long. Hmm. And so I'd say three sessions. If you have a chronic condition you've had for 20 years, you want to keep coming back. I'd say 10 sessions is probably a good start. Um, but I don't want to make people dependent on this modality like they're dependent on medications. I want to empower people to take responsibility for their own health and start to really tune into their body. And tuning into your higher self in the egg is going to help you tune into your own intuition, your own innate um healing of the body and you're going to start to say okay this left this right shoulder started hurting when this man in my life started abusing me or whatever you know so you're going to say hmm maybe it's emotional maybe my body's given me this message about what i need to do to fix myself and mm. you know do you know dr uh, zach bush uh vaguely yeah so 
he just closed his practice because he said, I realized I wasn't giving anybody any help because they were coming to me to heal and they need to learn how to heal themselves. So he closed his mm. practice and he's going to create a whole new program like journey to resonance to help people to learn about breathing and, you know, tuning into their own bodies and healing themselves because wow. we're in that time. We got to empower people. I really admire him. So I want people to, to use this for maintenance after the emergency is over, after they feel good. I want it. I want them to use it to really up their spiritual growth um, so it'll work on the physical, the emotional, the environmental, the spiritual. So for me right now, I go in there for spiritual healing. And of course, there's always going to be something emotional that comes up. You see something on the news, you know, something happened here in my neighborhood. There was um, a cop pulled over a lady. They left the cop car on the train tracks <laughs> while they were searching her car and a train hit the car, the cop car with the lady in it. And you see on the body cam, the cops are going, was the suspect in the car? Oh, my so goodness. It was just blocks from my house. So, of course, you know, there's trauma like this. I started to feel into the empathy of this poor woman who was watching a train coming at this car. She's in the car. She's handcuffed. She can't get out. That Think is, about the fear. That's terrible. And you see the car just. And they show the stuff. It's amazing. And so there's trauma. So I will go into the egg, release that trauma. But for the most part, I like to use it for my spiritual healing, increasing my intuition. Um, my niece is now thinks that I'm like a parlor trick for her. And she's like, okay, here's a picture of this person in my class. Tell me all about him or her. And I'll say, blah, 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 blah. And I don't do this for a living, but she's she thinks this is a cool parlor trick from her auntie now. <laughs> but to me, it's it's about the egg clearing the veil and i'm not just saying just the egg any kind of sound and light therapies um any kind of energy modality can do this and we're really just increasing our intuition and tuning into these they're not even gifts they're ability abilities we have everybody has them but it's like a muscle you've got to develop it hmm yeah, I have direct experience without going into details of uh, a physical problem that turned out to be definitely something that was going on in my, I don't even want to say mine because I think it was deeper than that. So I have no problem. Uh, like that makes sense. What I wonder is, what do you think the, the limits of that are? Like you sit there and you contemplate it like, okay, talking about like maybe pain in your left foot. I have no problem believing that can go away. What about, though, when you start getting into something like multiple sclerosis or, or cancer or something like that? Um, I'm wondering, what do you think the limits are? And I, I'm not asking, I don't want to ask a question that forces you into a tight position, but I'm just curious your thoughts. You're not. Um, okay. You don't make any claims, but think about it this way. I'll throw the question back at you. If you break a bone, don't you believe it's going to heal? Yes. If you gash uh, you know, your arm open and it's bleeding everywhere, you can even see the bone there, you, you know they can stitch it up and it'll heal, right? Right. So why have we been hoodwinked to believe that we can't heal from MS or cancer or Parkinson's or anything? The body doesn't know disease by name. We name it and we give it an address and we call it mine. It's, you know, my allergies, my asthma. My, we give it an address so it, it has a nice comfy home there. But I had asthma for many years, and so there could be a past life tied to that. Hmm. My asthma, my asthma, right, is gone now. And I am very grateful for it because it taught me this. I had a reoccurring nightmare for all my whole life. I would fall underneath um, an ice where, you, you know, you ice fish and you, um, you have the hole there. So I would fall underneath the ice, and I couldn't find my way back up, and I would drown. And it was a reoccurring nightmare. After doing sound and light therapy, a few sessions, that nightmare went away and it went away with the asthma. Hmm. So was that a past life? How does our past life know our current life? How does our DNA know that this wasn't, this didn't happen in a past life? So what I was taught by um, Julia Cannon in her book, Soul Speak, 
Dolores Cannon's daughter. If asthma was from a past life and your DNA didn't realize you drowned or you were hung or you got your head cut off or you were choked to death, the DNA is like, oh, I don't know what this is. So I'm going to just make it asthma in this lifetime. Hmm. So it's kind of like epigenetics spread out over a really, really long time span. Right? right. That's so fascinating. It blows your mind if you think about it. Now, asthma could be other things as well. Um, you know, my, my nephew developed asthma after he was, he was four years old. And my dad was his best friend. And my mom was his second best friend. So you got a four-year-old kid and grandma and grandpa are watching him five days a week. And that's what he knows. He knows grandma and grandpa. He's grown up now. He's four years old. My, gra- my dad, his grandpa dies. 11 weeks later, my mom dies. So his best friend and his second best friend die. He has no concept, no cerebral cortex. No, I mean, no concept of what's going on just yet. He's four years old. And he developed asthma. Hmm. Is that a coincidence? Because grief holds in your lungs, right? So if grief's holding in your lungs... To me, it made sense that this was developed from the grief that he didn't know how to process as a four-year-old boy. Mm. So my sister has been an amazing mother to help him process the grief. And now he plays basketball and he's 10. Wow. That's really interesting. So, <clears throat> so one of the things that I'm curious about, and I asked the medical intuitive Wendy Coulter about this as well. She's an, another person who's, you, cool. you know, She's Wendy? Cool. I watched the interview. No, I, I watched your interview with her. She's oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. I, yeah. I like Wendy a lot. She's really, a really fun person to talk to and very uh, knowledgeable. So what I'm always curious about, we have these, assuming that it is correct, that um, we have an innate ability to heal ourselves. It, it makes me curious about, like, I try to think back, how did civilization, humanity, how would it ever have gotten to the point where we stopped trusting that? Like, you, you imagine everybody's going along and everything's cool. It's like, hey, I, I know how to heal myself. Why would, how could anything sneak in to undermine that and get us to this position where people doubt ourselves and are mired in disease and stress and all this? How could that have, do you have any thoughts? And I know this is kind of like a weird question. Do you have any thoughts about how that could have been introduced to begin with? Well, you follow the money, you follow the greed and you know, look at the medical training and I love my doctor friends, but look at the medical training that they don't get nutrition, energy. So, you know, my medical doctors tell me that their training is basically you got a stomach problem. Here's the training on what stomach drug to give to you. And then you have the DO doctors that are trained a little bit different. The chiropractors are trained a little bit different. The naturopathic doctors are trained a little bit different, Mm. but who's really trained on, you know, energy and the auric field and how that works and how sound, how we're vibrational beings of sound and light. And so you can't patent sound and light. So there's really no money to be made Mm. off of sound and light. And so I feel like we got on this really bad path where all of a sudden we stopped trusting our bodies and we would run to a doctor. What's wrong with me? Any doctor, any healer, what's wrong with me? Instead of looking at ourselves and saying, what's wrong with me? And I think that's where we went astray. And you know, that it does it because it makes me think of like fast food. We all know fast food is bad. Our body reacts to it badly. And yet it is um, a temptation. And for some people, an irresistible temptation. So it does, it, it makes sense that an externally manufactured unhealthy alternative could supplant a healthy alternative. Like, yeah, that, that totally, I could see that. Well, look at too the quick fix mentality that we have. If we're not getting our hamburger like that, even though it tastes like crap and it's not good for us, who wants to take the time to make a nice hamburger patty and put it on the grill or put it in the oven or put it, it takes a lot of time. And I feel like these days we are so inundated with stuff to do. No one's sitting there in silence and trying to tune into their intuition So we want this quick fix mentality. Oh, if I can get my blood pressure down with this pill, I'm just going to take this pill. Let's look at what's the root cause. Maybe it's just a lack of a lack of hydration and you're dehydrated. And that's why you have high blood pressure. We're not looking at that. So I really think that we have all these technologies and so much stuff to do. And and they keep us so busy with paying our bills, um, you know, 
working at our job and, you know, focusing on so many different things that we don't have time to really tune into what's really important in life. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and to anybody, uh, to the people that are, I'm saying this more for them, because I know you're aware of this, because I uh, emailed you about it briefly, but you probably already know anyway. Right now, there is what's called the, the reproducibility crisis, a replication crisis that is going on, where they're finding all of these um, scientific studies, including foundational scientific studies, are um, they can't be replicated, right? With replication being the gold standard for science. <laughs> and um, And so... It's just really weird to me that that's not more in public discourse because that is really, really significant. I mean, that's a big deal because it's calling into question the foundational studies upon which all of the subsequent studies have. It's basically calling into question the foundation of a lot of scientific ideas, um, which is really wild. I don't know exactly what to make of it. Like, I'm not embroiled in that. There's all these people having this conversation, but it's significant because it, it implies that we don't. We can't replicate these things. We don't know them as well as we think we do. And so if we don't, then why not be open to the harmonic egg? Why not be open to these other ideas? You know, and I just, it strikes to what you're saying about they, you know, it's like, why are they keeping this discussion so muted when it, it should be a very important discussion that we're all having, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty crazy right now what's going on, but I really trust humanity. Um, and I think we will prevail. I have so much optimism for the future. And I'm seeing so many more people um, stepping away from the medical science, because you know, what is science? And why do they take the voice away from the people? And so that's why with the harmonic egg, there's no way to test the subtle energy bodies, but how can you deny thousands of people now that tell testimonial after testimonial after testimonial? And I hired an SEO company. I thought this was quite comical. One of the biggest searches that people are doing, the keywords are negative effects of a harmonic egg, negative reviews. Mm -hmm. So it's like they're looking for something that says it doesn't work. So I typed it in, I, you know, I went on the internet and I said, you know, negative reviews of harmonic egg, nothing comes up. All these positive testimonials are coming up. Well, that's not really science, but if science is a, you know, a topic that you've studied that has an organized knowledge base and it's a particular subject, why can't testimonials be science when you have thousands of people saying that it's helped this or that or another thing? Mm -hmm. Why are we taking the voice away from the people? Right. It would be like, I wonder if, and I don't know where the money would come from from this, because it feels like ideally <laughs> the way to really take on skeptical inquiry and to really get into this would be to actually measure people for their ailments before and after the egg, right? And then have objective external analysis of that. <clears throat> but uh, I don't even know how you'd go about like, or which is the same issue that Wendy Coulter ran into is trying to find the resources to conduct such a study, right? Well, we did um, pre and post blood work. We did pre and post heart rate variability. We did pre and post um, gas discharge visualization camera, but I can't replicate that those results of the GDV camera. So in right. my engineering mind, I said, okay, I, I hired a girl from New York who is one of the foremost authority experts on the GDV camera in the United States. I flew her to Colorado. We had a great time together. We set her GDV pro next to my GDV pro and tested each other and then tested the energy around the egg. And we got two different results. Hmm. And if I can't replicate the results, then I can't trust the device. Right. So I told her, take it home. It was a $10,000 piece of equipment. I'm like, take it home. I've got a hundred hours of training on it. And then, yes, it helps some people. But now I wonder if it was just a good guess, you know, that I was saying, oh, it looks like it picked up an issue with your thyroid or whatever. And, you know, I can't treat or diagnose not being a, you know, a doctor, but I can show them the results that are coming out from the GDV camera. But in, in the end, I couldn't really trust the results. So I also had a lady come in with them. Um, there's a device that's a Tesla coil and it just looks like this little circular thing and you hold on to it or you set it on your body and you're 
put it on a machine. Well, her mom was sitting next to her when the test was being done and she was maybe a 12 year old child. And all of a sudden they said, okay, the child has parasites and started poisoning the child's body with a parasite cleanse only to find out that the energy that was picked up on the machine was the mom's energy. So they poisoned the child's body because they were testing the child, but the energy that was picked up was really the mom's energy. The mom had the parasites. Hmm. So we got to be really careful. We got to be really discerning. You know, there's human error. There's, you know, everything is energy. So how do we take that out of the equation? And that's what I love about the harmonic egg. It's a consistent and repeatable device. You're in there by yourself. No one's in your energy field affecting your energy field. It's just you and God, source, creator, universe, you know, whatever word you use, it's just you in there having a spiritual experience and tuning into your own body. You can feel, you know, your blood flowing and your heart beat if you really are quiet in your mind. And it's a beautiful experience. I don't do well with group healing. Because in a group healing, I'm picking up other people's energy and I leave that healing, quote unquote healing, feeling a lot of different people's energies that they released. And so there's a lot of empaths that feel that way. But there's also a lot of people that go to a group healing and they leave not knowing why do I feel sad? Why do I feel Hmm. fearful? Why do I feel something that may not be theirs? Interesting. So something I've seen you discuss before was the uh, how different instruments seem to have um, specific different effects, uh, health effects. Could you talk about that a little bit? Because I found that really, really interesting. That's pretty cool. So I kept tuning into the solfeggio suite and the frequencies and the rife frequencies. And I realized I'm like, rife was brilliant in the 1930s to the maybe 50s. And he he created some really great frequencies, but... The frequencies, crea- the frequencies he created are no longer, in my opinion, the same frequencies for the mutations of the diseases that he came up with. So if he came up with a frequency that would kill cancer in the 1930s, the cancer we have now in the you know, 21st century is different hmm. than the 1930s cancer. So you know, people are still using his frequencies with some people have good luck, but it could also be a bit of a placebo effect thinking, oh, Rife was so brilliant and this is going to work. And then it does work. So then I thought, I don't really want to do that because at this point, the egg is vibrating at maybe about 1200 Hertz. And so why would I want to put 528 Hertz in a device that's vibrating at 1200 Hertz? And people will come in, um, people that know David Hawkins work, power versus force. If they're vibrating at a place of love, I want to put them on something at least at the level that they're vibrating at or above. So it seemed like because there's, you know, no one size fits all, I started looking at the waveforms of instruments. So the simple waveform of the flute, um, it seems to be working with the liver. And then also with orange light, the simple waveform of the drums will be working with building the um, immune system. So after doing live blood analysis, we are seeing more white blood cells after some of the sessions with drumming or didgeridoo, mm. something, those low pitched instruments. And so I started looking at Kay Gardner's work. Um, she was brilliant. She's passed now. And she's probably taught me the most about the waveforms of the instruments and how they can work with different organs. So if you look at our body as an orchestra and you, if you're listening to an orchestra and then all of a sudden you hear one of the maybe a violin player go out of tune, you're just like, oh my gosh, that's terrible. Well, our organs can get it out of tune and we want our or- our organs to be playing like a fine-tuned orchestra. So I feel like I'm tuning the, or- the organs of the body with the instruments that we're using in the music and the harmonic egg. Hmm. Man, that, that's really interesting. And so in addition to healing, um, I guess this is kind of a form of healing. You have uh, observed that it has, uh, I don't know how to phrase this, it doesn't reverse aging, aging can't be stopped, but it, it can maintain your health despite your aging, I think is a better way to say it. Uh, would you say that's accurate? So I'm real tired right now, but um, uh, the, the full moon's coming. So the full moon energy sometimes gets me. Um, but I'm going to be 52 years old and I can't find the wrinkles. And I went to my 25 year reunion years ago 
um, my high school reunion and I'm looking at some of the people, I'm like, oh my gosh, like they look so old. And so I had a, a lady who is a scientist and she does radiesthesia, which is the use of the pendulum as the Egyptians t- taught it hmm. back in the back in the ancient times. And she said, I believe that the egg is strengthening the telomeres, which is what ages us, as some people believe. Um, it's not lengthening them, but she said it's definitely strengthening them. So I don't believe that we, you know, why do we age? Do we age because we tell ourselves we have to age or do we age because, um, you know, maybe traumas? What if we could release the traumas? What if we didn't have to age? What if we could just live a very good quality life until we're ready to move on to the next journey? Mm -hmm. I mean, what are the rules of aging? Right. So yeah, there was a, an end to illness, I think was the title of the book that I read years ago. And this was coming purely from a mechanistic uh, medicine perspective. There was nothing spiritual or anything about it. I hope I'm getting that right. But his suggestion was also that um, is what you just said, that illness is not necessarily uh, inevitable, uh, that you can just kind of get older. And then one day the kind of the light goes out and you're dead. You you don't have to go through that long decline. Although um, I am really curious about that because it it makes me wonder like how much again what are the limits of that? And the reason why I say that is because I still I work out a lot, and um, I am definitely in good shape for my age. But I'm not as explosive and fast as I was when I was 25. And I don't think anything I don't I don't believe that anything I do is going to make me as athletic as I was when I was 25. Of course, there is the exploratory part of my mind that's like, well, maybe that's because you don't believe it. But then it's like, no, I don't know, dude. I don't know if I can imagine myself being, you know, like, say, 65 and like still out there kickboxing and stuff. But I don't know. What do you think the limits are on that? I don't think there are any limits. I think you put your own limits on it. I think you already answered your own question on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Have you ever seen that, though? I mean, have we ever seen a 65-year-old person who could, say, compete in the NBA or well, uh, be a world are, champion there, kickboxer? Or I'm Trying to think. There's one lady that I saw online that was pretty buff, and she was still you know, a weightlifting champion. There was one guy that was doing like dirt bike racing in another country, and he was 80s. Um, so I think we have seen it and it's maybe we think it's a anomaly or, or some kind of different, you know, oh, that's just unique to that individual. But I, I believe that intention is everything. And if you set an intention, I think it can you can do it. There's so many people that have lifted cars, you know, and because they were they had all this adrenaline going because they felt like, oh, their family member was maybe under a car and they just lifted it up like it was nothing. So I don't think, I don't know. I don't think that the, the human body has limits. I think we have programmed limits to the human body. That's, that's, yeah, that's wild because then that would assume that if we all became uh, enlightened to the point where we threw off all of these limitations, all of these shackles, that um, humanity would be immortal in a physical sense, which we is, really that's a pretty, that's a heavy thing. What was that? I don't think I really want to live forever. <laughs> right. Well, that, that was actually a thought that I had. Like when you think about over the lifespan of a person, maybe um, part of that degeneration in athletic athleticism and things of that nature maybe it is just that as you go on it's like you know i don't really have the um ambition that i had before because i've gotten older and i've kind of realized that that's not where happiness is that's not really where it is and so like your body maybe kind of naturally declines as you come to peace first with the reality of of life and that you're not. You're never going to get rich enough to make yourself happy, and so maybe it is a reflection of the the mind. To the like, yeah, I don't. I don't know if I'm explaining that uh, properly. Yeah. Well, okay. So my boyfriend used to like to race motorcycles and fast cars. Well, now he's got a truck that looks like a boat, and he's got his motorcycle that has the fairing on it and the radio, and you know, it's it's like a little car um, because he's evolved to the place where he feels that's where 
where his happiness is, not in racing motorcycles and cars. That's not where he gets his, his happiness anymore. At the age of 70, that's he's 70 now, he loves to just kick back on that motorcycle that has the fairing and the fancy stuff and the radio, the radio and dress ride 6,000 miles. That's where he gets mm. his happiness. So I think you were explaining it perfectly mm. to say, you know, our, our goals change as we mature and as we age and we have different, different goals later on in life. That, that is, and we're coming up on an hour, so I don't want to abuse your time, but, um, I know in this interview, uh, I've, I listen to so many of your interviews, I don't want to get them tangled up, but we've discussed, uh, you believe in reincarnation and, uh, you know, multiple lives. <clears throat> and so, um, makes me, what I often wonder is if you reach this point where you, you attain what can generically be called enlightenment, <clears throat> um, do you still go through that same life arc? In the next uh, birth, do you, do you still go through that young, ambitious, really driven by sex and all of these things and then gradually decline? Or do you just come kind of come into it like with a grasp of what is really um, important? What do you think on that? I think it's your soul's journey. Um, so, I mean, what if in between lifetimes, uh, say I, I mean, this is going to be kind of hard to, to talk about, but what if I say to my friend, I want to experience what it's like to be murdered. Will you murder me in the next lifetime? What if we said that? What if we said, Hey, I want to experience, uh, you know, what it's like to be, uh, autistic and teach the world how beautiful this, this, what we call as a condition or disease. I think it's a beautiful, normal, um, expression of the autistic community. They're, they're amazing. They're brilliant. They're wonderful. And what if I said to some, one of my souls, will you be my mom? And can I be autistic? And will you show the world how beautiful autism is? What if, you know, you, you have to make these contracts, I think, in between lifetimes to decide what you want to experience. One, one life you want, might want to be poor and homeless. And then the next life you might want to experience money and unhappiness and then maybe the next one is money with happiness so i think that there's so many different answers to that question on what the soul wants to experience Hmm. i have listeners skeptical they don't believe the egg they don't believe the egg's gonna work what would you tell them what would you tell somebody who had um say some kind of chronic pain in their back and um, nothing in mainstream medical science is helping them, but they're very skeptical of the egg. What would you say to them? I was the biggest skeptic. So for sure, that's the first thing that I say to people. And, and a lot of people respect that I have an engineering background and, and that I was, you know, and still am skeptical. When some of the center owners tell me what the egg is doing for their clients, I still say, come on. And that couldn't have happened. Come on. How did that happen? I still do it. I can't help it. So I would say to people, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. If you just try it, there's no side effects. If you don't drink enough water, you can get a headache and maybe a little nausea, but there's no, there's no side effects that would hurt you. So why not give it a try? And if you look at the practicality of it, you know, lower back pain, um, L4 and L5 is about abandonment. Lower back pain can be financial issues. So mm. every, every part of your body that's in pain has a message like Louise Hayes work and Michael Lincoln's work messages from the body. Everything has a source. So, I mean, what do you really have to lose? That's what I always tell people. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. And so lastly, is there anything else um, that you didn't get to share that you would like to any other projects or anything about the egg or anything else that we just didn't discuss? Well, shoot. I wanted to have a deeper conversation with you because I think you're fun. And oh, I'm, I'm happy to. I, 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 no, I, you know, I, I do have to run because I'm running another meeting. Okay. But I really enjoyed um, your interviews that I've watched and, and your thought process and how deep you go into different topics. And for me, um, I'm getting to the point where I've done so many interviews, it's kind of boring anymore. <laughs> like, blah, blah, blah. I was an engineer from Detroit. Blah, blah, right, blah. right, right. And so I love, you know, um, one of the things that I was going to talk to you about that I thought was comical, 
made me think of it in one of your interviews was when I was making the decision to move from Michigan to Texas. It was a big decision. I had never left my family. I was 27 years old and I'm talking about, you know, leaving. I had a house, had a good career going. And I said to the universe, show me a sign. I need a sign because I don't know if this is the right decision. I pulled out of a McDonald's and yes, I ate McDonald's and I got to the end of the, the road on Telegraph Road and this guy was walking down the street and he was definitely cowboy hat, Texas boots, Texas, you know, I'm thinking about moving to Texas and you don't see tech, uh, cowboys in Michigan. Comes up to my car. He says his car broke down, a, you know, a little ways back. He needed five bucks for gas. I gave him the $5. And then I thought, that was my, that was my sign. So I drove around the block. No car was broken down anywhere. I couldn't find the cowboy. I was out five bucks. Man, that's awesome. But I mean, those are the kind of conversations that were coming up into my mind when I was listening to some of your interviews. But people, I think you got to look for the signs. Even when I was on George Norrie on Coast to Coast last week, he said, do people miss the signs every day? Every day people are missing the signs of what they should be doing. They're not paying attention. They're on their phones. They're texting and driving. They're talking and driving. They're thinking about what they're going to do next. They're thinking about what they did last week. We're never present enough. We're missing all the signs. So if I could leave your audience with, you know, that, I think it'd be really, really fun. That, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That's the weird thing. There's the synchronistic architecture to reality, but yet we still somehow have our free will to the sense that we can ignore the architecture, even when it's right in our faces, which is so weird. And I think is the big paradox and the thing that I'm always trying to understand. And, um, yeah, I, I, like I said, more of my mentality now is to have fun. And when my mom passed away, one of the messages that she gave to me is if it doesn't bring you joy, don't do it. Like, do mm -hmm. things in joy. You got to find that joy. And it's been really hard to say no to a lot of things because it's not going to bring me joy. And I'm at the point, you know, I want to just enjoy and have more joy in my life. And, you know, if people find the egg, it's not going to be right for everybody. But I'm so grateful that more of these modalities are coming out. People are going to start finding non-invasive ways of healing and, um, you know, being empowered to heal themselves. And if it's not the egg, that's okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, for me, it's just about, you know, educating people, empowering mm -hmm. people. That's what I really, I really get a kick out of.